Hello, I'm Claudia Bester, Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Billy Wilder Theater. Um, tonight I'm pleased to host another special evening with the Zocalo Public Square Lecture Series. Here to introduce our guests is Zocalo's founder and director, Gregory Rodriguez. Thanks. Hi all, thanks all for coming to the 39th Sokolo event of uh, 2011. Um, we're grateful, as always, to the Hammer Museum and to Claudia Bester in particular for, for hosting us tonight. Um, if you haven't been to Sokolo before, uh, we are a small nonprofit that, uh, that uh, imagines itself to be a uh, living magazine. We roam around LA and we blend on the ground events with online idea, idea journalism. We're a nonprofit. We present about 50 free events in LA and beyond every year, uh, followed by uh, wine receptions where you can talk further with. Uh, each other and uh, whatever the, whoever the guests are that evening. And now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests, Mr. Gus Van Sant and Mr. Brad Klopfel. Gus Van Sant is a director, screenwriter, painter, photographer, musician. Beginning in the 1980s with Mala Noche and Drugstore Cowboy, he'd helped revitalize American independent film. He was nominated for Academy Awards for directing in 1997 for Good Will Hunting and in 2008 for Milk, and his film Elephant was awarded the Palme d'Or at the 2003 Cannes Film Festival. He lives in Portland. Architect Brad Klopfel is the founder of Allied Works Architecture. The Hammer Bookstore will be selling their new book, Allied Works Architecture, Brad Klopfel Occupation at the Reception. It's a chronicle of their work from the projects um, <clears throat> that established Mr. Klopfel in the early 1990s through the present, including the influential projects like the we Wyden Kennedy Building in Portland and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City. Mr. Klopfel lives in Portland and New York and designs new institutions, creative workspaces, and private residences nationally and internationally. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Gus Van Sant and Brad Klopfel. Thank you all for coming. Um, so we're here to talk about why we live in Portland and why we, <coughs> why we work why, there. Why do we live in Portland? Why do you live in Portland? No, why do you live in Portland? <laughs> well, I, I'm a member of the, uh, the Hollywood community, I think, but I, th I like to stay up in Portland to stay away from influences here in town that um, I, can, I think, you know, kind of infiltrate my, my artwork and I try to keep away from that. Yeah, I, th I think there's a there's a personality type, uh, maybe that we share something that we share, of needing the distance, of just we we were just talking earlier today about architecture in New York. I think is like film in L.A., where everybody's there, everybody wants to be there. Every party you go to, you see the same you know twelve architects. I mean, there's just this sort of mirror reflecting back that some people thrive on, and then some people flee to Portland, Oregon, um, and take solace in that, in that place, in that landscape. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, for me too, that's, the distance allows you time. I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know how one works without that, that time and distance. For, for me, it's absolutely the essential. Yeah, the refuge. Yeah, exactly. I think for me, probably the same. Um, <clears throat> that you're just hunkered down, able to do your work. It rains a lot. Um, it does rain a lot. It's, uh, um, he, down here, you feel like you need to go out and play in the sun. And also, also, for me, it's it's a matter of that landscape. Um, what what ins what inspires the work? This is something we're going to talk about too. And where I learn a lot from looking at buildings, you know, it's sort of like taking taking classes. And especially when you can see a good building, which happens far too rarely, but when you see buildings, you learn a tremendous amount. But, but as far as the kind of genesis, the sort of uh, spiritual inf uh, inspiration for the work, for me, it has to do with the landscape. And I think part of that is growing up in the West. Um, but but that, that sense of awe and wonder that one you know, glimpses on occasions when you're out, even farther out, um, the, the, those, those, that's the fuel for me. Uh, yeah, I think for, uh, I've started in my career in Los Angeles and never really got anything going. I was uh, assistant to a director and uh, moved away after about six years of living here and not realizing that maybe uh, like getting an agent was the, the, way, the right way to go. Um, I didn't really know that they 
they were so important. And I left town <laughs> and worked in uh, New York City for about three years, saving up money to make uh, a small independent film called Malanoche. And it was set in Portland, and it was a, a very irreverent piece um, and um, uh, something that you wouldn't necessarily make. It was a novella written by Walt Curtis, and it was something that you wouldn't necessarily make into a, um, a film, but that was sort of exactly the reason I was drawn to it, I think. Um, and uh, since it was set in Portland, I toyed with the idea of staying in New York and sort of using, like, I had a job at that, at that time, a pretty good job, and using the Bowery as the backdrop, but instead went to where its original location in Old Town in Portland. And really just to get away from the whole, the whole part of the business, uh, Portland really had a very small but um, tight movie making community. And to um, sort of uh, take refuge there and make this very small film. I had saved up a very, very tiny amount of money, I think $20,000, and uh, used local um, non-professional actors and, and really with the idea that from there it would uh, get sort of the next small film going. And it just kept escalating. And, and it, was a, it was a local um, Portland story and I kept sort of looking for more Portland local stories to, to continue. Right. I, I like this idea of the role of place in both of our, in both of our works. I, I started my career in LA as well, living downtown in the old days on Spring Street, going to Al's Bar, which there might be a few people here. Yeah, sort of, I was basically drinking my sorrows away from working for corporate architecture. Uh, and really, it was on, was on the precipice of getting out of architecture. Ended up doing various things, going to graduate school in New York. And then when starting my practice, in kind of very parallel terms, going back to the Northwest to do this ideal project, as I call it, with the Mary Hill Overlook, the very first thing I did, which was sort of half architecture, half installation piece. And it was just, it was sort of mining the, the sense of place and emotion and scale and experience that I that I knew and, and that was that was one of the things we, we we were talking about earlier too is just where the you know what is that inspiration like in the in the book I spoke with various artists Anne Hamilton Doug Aiken, and others and just asked the idea of of what what does the work serve you know this this notion that you're making work in service of something I think other than your own ideas certainly certainly that inspires me but well, you're playing with the, <clears throat> the, the format, the original concept of, in, uh, in a film, original concept of story and what an audience like, relates to as story, and you're working within that and trying to expand that into something new, hopefully. But, yeah, Which you mentioned, like, making something that hadn't been experienced before. It's, well, it's, it's interesting. For me, it's, I don't even know if it's possible to make something that hasn't been experienced before. In the, in the physical world, but, but I think... But your desire is... Yeah, seek, to seek some kind of insight, to reveal... I use this word amplifier a lot. It comes up with that little piece that, that we were going to do for the Portland Art Museum. But, but thinking as, of the acts of building, of the acts of making, that as, as a sort of amplifier or lens to reveal some insight about either the place or the, the activity that happens there, physical environment, urban environment, anything. And I think the specificity of that quest of the architecture to burrow in and to, to dwell in. I mean, I, th I think there's, it's funny, both of us in very public works, all of our work being revealed in the public realm. But for me, this notion of specificity, almost to the point of intimacy, I'm not quite sure how much intimacy architecture can really create in the end, given its scale. But, but the idea of, of burrowing into some kind of deep insight that can only be re revealed through the experience of that building, that's certainly an inspiration for me. And that insight can be very small, actually. It doesn't have to be profound. I mean, so, so much of architecture is bombastic and sort of manifesto-driven, and we will make new form and new materials and new everything new. And, and in some ways, mining things that are old are some of the most powerful realms. 
So by insight, you mean like the moment that you actually have the idea? Yeah, or just more, more in, uh, seeking insight for people who engage the buildings. That they see things they wouldn't have, that they see things that they wouldn't have seen without the architecture. And a lot of the times in my work, it's, it's, it's creating the context for art. So preparing people to see things in the work of others, right? Or preparing them to engage things in the city. I mean, in the, in the new Clifford Still Museum, it's going to open in a, in a month. It, we built this very small building next to a very large civic institution. Notice the, the, the Denver Art Museum is a kind of extroverted, very object-driven, very spectacular kind of building. And we did the opposite for Clifford Still. We, we burrowed it into the ground and really sort of brought it to the surface and created a, a, an entirely different context, urban context, for that. So part of it's responsive to place in that way, but, but part of it is just sort of assessing what's missing, almost. You know, what, what can you add to the conversation? What, what can you add to the conversation? Um, things that, I mean, also there was the, the, the idea, the notion of what you, what you leave in and what you take out as, like, the creation of the, the, the piece itself. It's like... Um, you can only include so much before it becomes muddled and uh, confusing. But, um, but I, it's, well, in, in architecture, I, we, we, I love this idea of editing. I mean, there's this crazy double process where you're, by building buildings, you're adding to the, the physical environment. You're manifesting all this money and material and all, this, all of this effort. And yet the goal, I think, for me is, again, not, not to uh, expand the conversation, but to, to almost to limit the conversation. I mean, use those buildings as, as ways of bracketing everything. I mean, there's, there's just so much excess and noise, as you know, in the, in the physical environment. So if you can engage a piece of architecture or a place that filters that noise out so that you might actually hear a couple of things or see a couple of things, I mean, I think it's as modest as modest as that. I mean, it's interesting in film because you have this format. It, it is interesting. The conventions of, of your industry of filling that hour and 20 minutes or what, I don't know what the magic number is, but it's somewhere in there, right? Hour and, yeah, half or two so, hours. So the editing is, is really in regards to what you address, I guess. How much you want to, how much you, how much, we were talking about this earlier about scale too. In, in architecture and film and, and the sort of level of bombast in productions and the kind of expansion and contraction of that, again, in that fixed body that film is. Yeah, um, sc yeah scale um, in film being um, <clears throat> preferable, I think, you know, uh, as far as, as, as wide as you can cast the subject and as small as, and intimate you can also make things within that subject is... Um, is kind of an amazing uh, desire, you know, to, to make it personal at the same time, uh, inc include like uh, a sort of vastness within it. Through the, which, through, th through the vessel of the intimate. I mean, your work's always that way. Has usually that, pretty intimate, yeah. Yeah, it has that compression, has that kind of absolute compression. So just given like the, the Wyden and Kennedy building, it's a, um, one of Brad's first projects, and it was uh, created out of a uh, one-time paint storage building that was turned into a cold storage warehouse that, uh, um, where they built small rooms uh, that were um, insulated with cork, about 10 inches wide of cork. So it was a very uh, difficult sort of um, um, nest of walls that took up a whole Portland block, and for some reason, um, Brad was part of the um, committee that selected that building mm -hmm. to turn into the Wyden and Kennedy headquarters, uh, an ad agency in Portland um, that's quite a good ad agency. Um, how, how did that like start? Why did you select that kind of a space? Yeah, it, it's, it's fun to be able to select sites. Um, we uh, did a lot of, it was, first of all, when that project started, I had, I had two employees. I was, I was on the verge of shutting down my office, you know, after having moved back from New York. Um, and we were in the competition with an office that had 150 people. 
and I got a call from Dan Wyden. I was literally, I mean, I just got in a big fight with my ex-wife. Huh, funny how that, <laughs> funny how that works. But, um, and I was walking back to the office to, to check my voicemail one last time. And Dan Wyden had called me. So I went across the street, had two scotches. And this is actually literally true. And then I went back and checked the machine. And he said, you know, come on over the next day. We want to talk to you about doing it. And so I called him at home as he asked. And he said, can you do this? And I said, absolutely. I have five employees. <laughs> so I really, you know, I did everything I could to exaggerate my possibilities to do that. So it, it started on this journey. I mean, also, there's something in that where, you know, you know, here's this person that was at the top of his game, Dan Wyden, you know, had grown this homegrown agency to be a global agency, and it's even expanded beyond. I think it's the last major privately held advertising agency. You know, and, and he reached down into this town. You know, I had designed this bar where they all drink, basically, is really how that happened. That's true. And he... And he Which bar was that? Saucebox. Saucebox. Yeah. Anyway, he reached down and he, and he elevated this little tiny studio to do this then $30 million building. You know, it was kind of a crazy risk. But that, I mean, b back to this issue of the edge. You know, I'm, I'm sure if he had been in New York, it would have been, you know, he would have had somebody search out the top 10 architects. You know, all of that sort of thing would have been an entirely different, so, so instead of a kind of, uh, instead of commissioning a piece of architecture, he would have collected a piece of architecture. And that's, I think that's what happens in larger cities a lot. That, you know, I, I probably again something to do with that self-consciousness of context, of cultural context, as you can't reach down and hire a two-person crappy little firm, you know. But when you selected this particular Sorry. building, what what was in? You wanted something that size. Yeah, it was it was size, and then and then we had to create a room inside for 450 people to gather in. So it was a pure, it was a perfect starter project. Because, big starter project, but it was, but we designed one room in the end, you know, and it was one room that, again, had a, you know, giant conference room and an auditorium for 400 people, and then that room became, to use that word again, became the amplifier of light and life and activity. It was the sort of center and soul of the building, and as we were building it, and, and Gus knows that, I'm sure he's been there for events. The room even took on, it's, it's a greater significance and it's the, it's the most used like, space in the city for nonprofit events, for, so you, it, was, it was like not only seeding a building and seeding a neighborhood as we talked about, sort of regenerating this warehouse neighborhood, but then became a public room where its initial intent was private. And I think it's the, the power of those, of those places that carry a kind of spirit and presence like that to transcend, I, I love the idea that it's used in ways that we never intended it, that it kind of goes on and just has this life and it's sort of generative in that way. But was there like a moment where you could say, uh, preserve the original building or like tear it down and start new? Well, that, that was a money, yeah, money endeavor. It was tax credits. Yeah, they hired a developer to help them do that part. So we took the existing building on the historic register and built a five-story new building inside of it. And so those things sort of duke it out. And I wanted to mention the, um, um, Dennis Oppenheim, his influence on... Oh, yeah. Well, on, it's specifically... On that building, as uh, well as others. Yeah, well, well seeking, seeking inspiration... Um, the Dennis Oppenheim piece, it's, I forget the name of it, it's a stack block piece, very early piece of his, that's a, a sort of solid object. And when we encountered this building, with, it had no natural light. It was a cold storage building. It had that quality. And so it was, it was a matter of just looking for reference, if you will. And I, a, a lot of times, I will look at art. I mean, that's probably more than anything else in the office and the research we do. You know, look at people's work who achieve a, 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 a kind of emotive and powerful uh, uh, position in the work and, and try to understand the, not the means and methods, but the, I suppose, the emotional agenda almost of those things or, or, or the purity. I, I, it's interesting, it's, I'm sure any working artist in the crowd would take me down on this, but there's a, you know, in, in architecture it's such a complicated public art that what you can, 
you can learn from those acts of simplicity and purity and the sort of singleness of ideas. The first building we did, the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, has uh, Richard Serra's first tilted spiral piece sited between us, between our building and the Pulitzer Foundation. And so I got to work with Richard quite a bit on siting it. And, and just those lessons learned from people who can make, I mean, in that case, a sort of lifelong making, um, but who can have the clarity of purpose and, and also, in that case, material and spatial order. So we look to artists a, a lot that way, just to learn, just to learn. Mm -hmm. And in the, now we're starting to begin to collaborate, like one of these projects, a sort of creative layering that we did uh, with Doug Aiken on a house that's under construction in upstate New York, kind of extended conversation. Great. <laughs> so back to you, Gus. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to uh, like just talk about the precise moment of inspiration. Yeah. When you have, like, when you're looking at something like that, or when you're drawing, or whether it's a stack of sugar cubes on a table and you see it and you go. That's Gus's idea of architecture. Idea. We stand there. <laughs> no, this one should go over here. Yeah. Uh -huh. My simple, yeah, version. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, <laughs> there, there's a distinction to the process, um, I think, between the two fields of, of film and architecture, in that one, well, the similarities are they both take a tremendous amount of time, two, three, four years. I mean, architecture, four, five, six years. Um, and in what I do, and what I think what a lot of my peers do, is you, you sort of trust the cycles the the moment of inspiration it could be a mark on the page could be something you see it could be a Wolfgang Leib piece I saw this uh, pollen room that he made on the floor I don't know if you guys have seen that it's an incredible thing you know so you see these things that that again manifest a quality that you associate with one of the projects you're working on and you you sort of gather that into this cycle of drawing and modeling and making so it's a it's a very iterative very labor intensive thing, but it, it, it's interesting that, you know, at the end of two years of drawing and making, you have a set of documents that, that are somewhat closed. I mean, before you build the building, the conversation, and yes, it starts anew when you build and you learn a tremendous amount, but, but as far as the intentional part of it, it's done after two years. Whereas your work is a and kind you're of... you're generally thinking of, a sp of space you're, and yeah, well, relation to space. Yes, yeah, well, form and space, yeah. But in your world, it's, it's never, I mean, there's not that kind of determinism. There's not that kind of trying to wrap up every little detail and no. create every little... I mean, usually for me, it's just a character. You see one character in a place, and that's where I see all of it. I see the whole kind of idea and story. And, in one and character? Mo usually in one character. And I usually see them just in passing. And it's a moment, just a moment. And from that, it's usually f you, you create the the story and and screenplay which isn't as as detailed as an architectural plan as we were talking about the screenplay um, is just a sketch it's a sketch and from there i mean the real work comes when you're bringing in all the artisans and they're filling out the screenplay and the you know um, designing the spaces and um, costumes and and so forth um, so yeah it's not it's a, a little it's a little more um, Fleeting for me, at least. But I, I love the transitions. I love the transitions from from word to to image to movement to time. Where ours is just a very simple. I mean, I'm I'm always endlessly fascinated how things we draw. You know, I start with smudgy charcoal sketches that then get more and more refined. But the things we draw and you project in three dimension become these incredible three-dimensional objects that you, you know, you learn so much from, but it's only one transition. It's not the moving, the sort of moving target, if you will, of, of film, where you, you're just sort of making it up. But aren't you, you able to, like, uh, act and react to what's going on in the construction of the... Yeah, for the architects piece. in the crowd, they could answer that question. People love that when you change things, when it's under construction. <laughs> but isn't it, isn't it, yeah, they isn't it necessary? That. You have to do it. What if yeah. it's just not working? Well, then you have to do it. If the blue tile is just not happening. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, first it's the sugar cubes, and then it's the blue tile. That's right. No, it has to be green. Yeah. Yeah. There's such respect between creative endeavors. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to go with that one. <laughs> All right, well, if you were uh, commissioning a space for the American Communist Party or the John uh, Birch Society, yeah. would, would they be the same space or different? Uh, yeah. Any, anybody in the crowd want to, we can take the question and answer. Um, now, the ethics of taking the project or not, we're, we're going to ignore that. Right. Well, you can con consider Well, that, yeah. you wouldn't take certain projects. I wouldn't. I mean, that's, it's, it's interesting that um, what, what you associate your voice with, uh, what you give voice to. I mean, from a specific point of view, there aren't that many forms of, from, not that many forms of architecture, actually. I mean, there's collective spaces, there's individual spaces, there's you know, various rituals, but in, in some ways the, the rituals aren't even that space specific. I mean, whether this room has pink chairs or funny lights or turquoise walls, it's still a room of this proportion with this acoustics. I mean, the, the, it, it's, it's not really the, the function, although it, there, it is at a kind of larger level, you know, whether it's a church or a school or a theater, but there aren't that many space types. I mean, a, a, you know, school classrooms, offices are all laboratories, right? I mean, big, flexible spaces, a beautiful proportion and beautiful light can accommodate so, so, so many things that way. So, but I think once, what you give your voice to is a different issue. And, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people questioning that this right now in this time of, of uh, rightfully boiling outrage. Um, so I think it's more and more important that architects, it's, it's funny because, you know, architecture relies on patronage too. And that, that whole trickle down economy, was that the Bushes? Was that our friends, the Bushes? Yeah. I mean, to the creative endeavors, we, we both, our work depends on that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So what projects would you not take? Uh, well, for me, usually, I mean, I, I, film, the film business is so uh, circus-like in its, in its places that money comes from, that it's usually the subjects and, and the stories that are either, <clears throat> you know, uh, something that you want to be involved in or not. Um, not so much where the money is trickling down from or coming from. Um, Unless there is like a specific like organization that you don't want to be involved with, but, um, but how do you, how do you determine the projects you do? Um, I I usually uh, am judging by a screenplay, or else I'm uh, um, developing it from scratch from this the fleeting moment that I I see it um, from that character that the you character saw. The character that I see. Uh -huh. yeah. That is your work, isn't it? I mean, the profound intimacy of that. Uh, uh, a bunch of films have been um, based on news stories that are um, that are already uh, um, widely known. Columbine Massacre mm -hmm. or um, mm -hmm. Kurt Cobain's Last Few Days um, that have been speculated upon over and over again. And I'm just making a sort of diorama that displays something about that. That's the insight part, though. It's because there's those stories that we all know, right, and they're sort of beaten with in the press. And, and, and usually ways. Uh, an unknown factor, like a mystery, something that isn't known or can't be known. And you, you project that on that story or you find that in that story? Um, I've been, tr you know, like in those cases, I was trying to find answers through just descriptions of, like, what, what it looked like so that the audience could read into it. So you're kind of creating an environment where they can add their own answer. Because the answers are essentially unknown. In, so, in some cases, like the Kurt Cobain um, piece, uh, there was a missing three days that uh, people speculated what happened to him in those last three days, which I think I was trying to say not very much happened. <laughs> um, but it was all, always like a, a point of like, interest. 
mm -hmm. I'm missing three days. I, I like the notion that you're kind of making a clearing in all of the, you're taking known events or, or apparently known events and you're sort of clearing them out from all of the preconceptions and all of the information we've been giving and allowing us to find our place in that, in that story. That's, that's extraordinary, actually. That's really extraordinary. You know, opening it up so that you're not um, maybe uh, giving a dissertation so much as just a, a sample of all the, the um, you know, suspect, suspected influences of that situation. I, I like this idea of frame of reference where um, in, the, in the book, when I was talking to some of the, some of the visual artists, it, it was, it was a, a really clear, at least in those conversations, distinction where they started with the individual, very much as you're talking about the character. But in, in Doug and in, uh, Anne's case, they both started with, with the body, some sense of the body moving through and engaging a kind of perception and experience. And, and with me, I think partly because of the na nature of architecture and the scale of architecture, and, and then perhaps because of my, my, the, the genesis of my work in the Pacific Northwest. But I start at the, at the infinite. I mean, it's, it's almost like you're sort of, you're, you're looking at the scale of a city or a landscape, the power of light, the kind of array of possibilities of form, and you're trying to manifest some kind of bridge that gets back to the body, right? And, and I think that's, that's one of those things for me that architecture can clearly, that's one of the responsibilities of architecture, I would even say, is to, is to wrestle with the infinite in that way and, and ideas of immensity and enormity, which also have that, 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 that opportunity for wonder and awe and all of the power in that. But try to get back somewhere close to, to the individual and the body. And, and I think that that scale distinction it's actually something that I find really fascinating in the last few years. That scale of distinction where the architecture either has to stop or, 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 or can only get to, then that, that missing scale is a fascinating thing for me. And I think allowing that missing scale <laughs> to be then reinterpreted by art or, or, or furniture or landscape, you know, plants or some in, intermediary thing is really interesting to me. I mean, sort of defining what I can do as an architect given the responsibilities and the language uh, and the pursuit and then letting that other stuff sort of find its, find its way some, somehow. I mean, there's so many architects, as you know, that, that will dictate, you know, the, 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 I think it was Hans Hoffman that designed the slippers for the people in his house and the robes and the textiles and, you know, you could only use right angle movements when you drank your co cup of coffee or something. But, but I mean, there, there is a historically, I think, in the profession of architecture, it, it's really about control, isn't it? I mean, that's an interesting point for me. And I, th I think I'm learning, as I get into this more, where the limits of control get you and, and even ways to, to try to, to uh, let's see, at least intentionally let things have their own life. We were talking earlier about the Clifford Still Museum. We did a, we, we looked in a way to form concrete. I wanted this building to be massive. And so we were looking at concrete and I wanted to, to cast it in a way that when we pulled off the forms, we wouldn't know exactly what happened. Um, so it would, it would have sort of a more chemical or mineral quality almost, you know, rather than something really designed and composed. And so all we could do, because the budget's quite low, um, was to design formwork that would break the concrete off when you pulled it off. And it terrified everyone, as you might imagine. You know, you, let, you give me your $15 million and let's see what comes out of that, you know, sort of flip the, flip the coin. But the, the power of that, 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 that border, that, uh, that sort of seam between what you can control and what you can't control is really exciting to, to play with. It's really fun to, to sort of have the will of that. And I couldn't have done that five years ago. There's no way I would have had too much fear, I think, to allow that to happen. Yeah, that's interesting that in architecture it's harder to, to be as out of control. Yeah, well, you're trained to do the opposite. You draw every detail. And you also, you're, we were talking about the, your, your um, 
sort of contained within history and you're breaking out of history at, at the same time as you're unable to or you're always working within a historical um, context? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because, because architecture is filled with so much bombast and, and sort of manifesto fervor and even to this day about the new, you know, partly it's a kind of post, post-war ideal, I guess, if, if we're not making something new, we don't matter. Must be uh, even a sort of capitalist, capitalist ideal. But if you if you look at the if if you think of actually your experience with space, it's a continuum. You know, going from the beautiful post office to the strip mall in this culture to whatever to this amazing piece of contemporary architecture in a library. It's it's really and that's compressing your uh, history to your own body and your own experience. But you you know even when you go culture to culture and you travel. It, it's one, it is almost one body of experience in that way. And, and I don't think, I think we always mine, we always mine the same series of emotions. And I think because there are so, I think there's very few new forms of architecture. There could be new shapes. People like to make new shapes in architecture, as you know, especially in the last 10 years. Um, but I don't think there's very many new forms of architecture. And I don't think there's, actually that many new spaces. It's really just how you set up the relationship with them. And, the, and then I think, I mean, in, in some ways, when you align with a certain emotional intent or experiential intent, you are aligning yourself with a history of exploration of, of both art and architecture, people that are pursuing certain relationships that they want to create between you and the experience. And what are, what are the, some of the most exciting things that you think are happening right now, Jeez. architecturally? Architecturally is tough. Architecturally is tough. I mean, I, th- I think things, you know, there's some really beautiful buildings being made by, by various architects. Um, but it's a tough, you know, it's, it's in a cultural context uh, where it just happens, you know, the demand for architecture that addresses ideas is so small. You know, the, the demand for novelty, you know, the demand for something clever to collect is huge, but the demand for insight and, 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 and thinking and ideas and reflection is, is tiny. So you look, again, to other disciplines. You know, you look to contemporary art more. Certainly I do. You know, you look to other means. And then I think, I do think there are more interesting things happening on the on the edge that happen to do with collaborations between people. It's something that we're doing more of and looking into more of. of I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, again, getting back to that issue of, of allowing yourself to let go, to say that here's an issue that you want to address. And this has to do with more propositional things. Here's an issue you want to address. Well, you know, I, as an architect, can only do you know, A, B, and C. So let's work with visual artists, or let's work with landscape architects, or media artists to extend the conversation in ways and collect all those things into one conversation. And, and people are doing that more and more. You know, people, I mean, you, you get places like Detroit. We're, we're doing research with some students about downtown Detroit, which has already been studied, you know, ad nauseum. Um, but you, you have these places where there's no model, you know, none of the existing economic, political models work, right? And, and, and I'm not even sure anybody knows what the goal is anymore. And so to think about what would be a generative intervention into those kinds of landscapes. We're also looking at a project in the, in the desert in eastern Oregon and, and questioning this issue of what is really built and unbuilt and what is natural and what's na- and not natural. And by the time you look at land use laws and invasive species and the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Land Management, it's, it is almost between, that between natural, <laughs> if you will, and urban or landscape and urban, there's just, it's one continual process of making for, for better or worse. And so to start to enter into these dialogues on the fringe of environment and infrastructure or however you want to name it, to, to, to create some awareness of those systems is really fascinating to me. Really, really fascinating. It's not, not quite the character, the character study. So where's this intimacy come from? Let's get into Gus Van Zandt, shall we? Which intimacy? Oh, with the well, yeah, I mean, stories. Yeah, that yeah. 
Um, why there? Why, why start there? Just personal interest. Why start with a character? Yeah, I mean, you're supposed to start with a character. I, I think guess that's, just, what novel, um, that's what novels... They represent, like, when I see, uh, I don't know, there's particular characters that I see engaged in something, they represent a, um, like, just infinite possibility of, like, you know, exploration. And so I, I become, like, attached to them, and it enables me to, uh, to spend the year and a half making the film. So you, you. So I'm starting with that, yeah. So you look at an individual and you are. <laughs> this, is, this is hard for me as an architect. You look for an individual and you're, you, you, you look at the. I don't really look for them, I just happen to see them. So you're in an airport yeah. With, yeah. with all of our peers at those airports that we all love, right? Yeah. Um, and you get inspired. And I see somebody um, um, maybe selling something that's not supposed to be in the airport. And then I find out that they're selling uh, maybe um, candy for um, their, um, the, a deaf school that they belong to. And I, I'll sort of like become entranced by this person and who they are and what they represent and you know, start to work on a story hmm. that involves them. And there is, all, there is always in your work this sort of marginal Right, this, I mean, at least, at least that's what people say, that there's this sort of alienation and marginalization, yeah. which, which I, you know, being raised in the position Not always, but you know, like a lot, often, yeah. But you're drawn to that. I think, uh, yeah, I, had, I have been drawn to that, but I'm not sure if it's not a, a way to get away from um, just the ordinary. You know, mm -hmm. just a way to get to another place from where to tell your story. Like, uh, like a filmmaker might go to the Wild West to tell a story. Um, a way to get, not that I'm, you know, fascinated with the marginalization itself, but like just a, a place from, from where to tell the story. So, so it, it, it's creating a, I mean, this, this issue of heightened awareness, or this idea of heightened awareness, so, the, so taking something that's more extreme or on the emotional edge or, the, or on one edge of the emotional range heightens some awareness. Or that's just unfamiliar to you, so um, you're uh, trans, you know, transported into mm -hmm. that world, into a different world than that's, the general audience would be. And that's a shared, that is, a, that is absolutely a shared pursuit, that you, you set up these contexts for people to see things they haven't seen before, right? Yeah. And you do that? When you, yeah, well, I hope I do that. <laughs> I think I do that sometimes. Um, but I, I, do, I do think it does take that a little bit. I, I, I use that, the, the power of scale to do that, that you might walk into a very small building and then it being inside being completely overwhelmed by the disjunction of scale that you had no idea. I think that happens in White and Kennedy. Historic mm -hmm. building, people think they know it, and they find this kind of crazy jungle gym of space inside there. And it, and it does sort of lay you bare in some way, you know, that... that that sense of wonder, or just, just sort of re-referencing in that way. Yeah, it, it does take that, doesn't it? Kind of emotional re-reference. Slap him in the face. Yeah, exactly. Uh huh. Huh. That was the metaphor. That was. <laughs> yeah. What else? Um. I think that pretty much. So. You're going to continue to live in Oregon? That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Although you have an office in New York City. So I have an office in New York, and that was because of the Museum of Arts and Design. What and is something. Allied Works, your company? Oh, God. <laughs> so, um, no, it's good. I'm, I'm redefining Allied Works in the next, in the next six months, too. Um, Allied Works was started as, a, as an ideal a quasi-socialist, ah, back to your other question, quasi-socialist ideal of a, of a collective pursuit of ideas. So, you know, that we would be working with various creative disciplines, that was thus the allied part, to do different kinds of projects. Um, and then lo and behold, we got, you know, for the last 10 years we had so many projects that those collaborations became with different disciplines, which was, is, still remains fantastic. Um, but, but relative to the conversation I just had a minute ago, we're going to get back to Allied Works being more of an initiator of projects 
and, and with those kinds of interdisciplinary projects, I mean inter interdisciplinary groups of people, both defining the problems and then, and then you know, seeking to model some kind of comment on those. But it was, it was really about a larger, a larger endeavor. And then when we got all these projects, you realize that Jesus just trying to get these projects built is about as large mm. as you can do. Great. I think, uh, so we take some questions and answers. Um, you spoke of, <laughs> you spoke of uh, going to Portland as an escape from the hothouse of Hollywood and New York. And I wonder if you could perhaps describe a little more the experience of living in a very civilized, middle-sized mm -hmm. city that has wonderful amenities but does not have that kind of peer pressure. Does it give you time to be true to yourselves and think things through in a more relaxed, more contemplative way than you might, you know, if you were here or in Manhattan? Yeah, I mean, for me, def I, I, I think I ended up in Portland, uh, really went back home from uh, like being in Los Angeles and New York to just sort of go to a place where I knew I could get things done um, uh, away from where I was because it wasn't really like working out for me in the bigger environments. And I think I did find that com complete, um, uh, very balanced city um, that was small and I had an effect on my city um, without the challenges of a larger city. And yes, yeah, so definitely more amenable and uh, very well balanced and completely devoid of uh, like the business that I was in. Almost completely devoid. Uh, there were documentary filmmakers, but not necessarily um, dramatic filmmakers. So yeah, it was, uh, I think I found it by chance because I, I ended up back there and I realized everything that was going well for me was happening from Portland and, and I just stayed there pretty much. It, it, it's interesting, I, I think of New York, oh boy, this is, this is, this is a, I'll push this for distinction, but there, there are people that can be generative at the same time that they're part of a conversation you know, there's, there's a sort of ongoing both intellectual and media conversation in certain places and certainly in New York. And then there's people who respond to, I mean, silence or respond to stepping out of that. Or, or I also think it's a matter of what, what you mine for creativity. I mean, you know, going to New York, going out to dinner with amazing people, hearing amazing speakers, obviously going to the museums, all of the other stuff. I mean, there's a kind of fuel you get from that. But, but for me, to, to know what to do with all that, I have to get away. I just have to. I can't. I can't. I think I, there's a lot of people that are so much quicker. You know, that you, know, you meet those people. They're just extraordinary. They can just filter that stuff and parse it out and be able to sort of take stuff in that they need. And there are those of us that just have to step back for a while. And, you know, Portland was a, was a very depressed, economically depressed, funky little town for most of our lives. Certainly most of my life there. I mean, the city that it's become in the last 10 or 15 years is, is thrilling. I mean, the, you know, that, that it has its own, I mean, it's always had its own identity, but the, the kind of vibrancy of things happening there now is, is I mean, it makes it easier to be there and, and stay there. Gentlemen, we have another question to your left. First of all, thank you for, for uh, trying to struggle with some of the abstract and, and make explicit some of the abstract notions with which you're dealing. Uh, secondly, a suggestion, and third, a, a question. The suggestion, and both the suggestion and the question, may reflect my own naivete. It would be helpful, it seems to me, in a subsequent conversation if you had a screen and could show us some of the architecture which some of us are not familiar with. The question has to do with your question, with your statement about statement about the shape and form, and I just don't understand uh, what that uh, distinction is. Boy, I, I wish another architect would take that one. So, in in this, in my yeah, my assessment, and it's really a, a current cultural comment. There has been a tremendous and is ongoing, tremendous infatuation with making new funny shapes, and that complexity of shape. Uh, is a corollary to complexity of thinking. 
um, which I think most of us know just isn't true. So, uh, f so this, this idea of giving form, well, there, there's an intention of making shape and composition, and then there's an intention of giving form to ideas and space and experience. And I think those are different pursuits. I think, I think it's, a, it's a parallel but very distinct track. And that's probably still too abstract, but maybe that's the best I can do. Sugar cubes. Back to sugar cubes, <laughs> yeah. That's right. I have another question over here. Hi, my name is Karen Lynn, and um, I love Portland. And I have a daughter who's 21, and she grew up in, like, Hollywood and, you know, around a lot of the whole movie scene and stuff. And um, this is kind of a strange question, but um, <laughs> she's an amazing girl who's 21 who's been living in Portland for three years, and um, she's looking for a job. <laughs> uh-huh. This is and, like the um, world's best mom right here. Well, I actually, this is absolutely, but I feel, I feel like, you know, she's a very special person, and in fact, Gus, she is friends with one of your recent um, actors in <laughs> one of your movies. So if you all have any ideas for her or could, like, email or something. She's an amazing, she does a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff going on right now up there. We're down here um, so missing, out, missing out. But Is it possible to somehow <laughs> possibly connect her well, with you? She can find through the uh, Oregon Film Board, she can find out wh who those people are and what they're shooting. And okay. Hi, um, I'm Alexandra and this is for Mr. Gus Van Sant. It's actually a thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you. I'm all the way over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm an independent filmmaker from UCLA, and I made a thesis short, and I couldn't have made it without you. So oh, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Oh, lovely. Good luck at UCLA. Hi, my name is Mimi Zeiger. I want to ask about the Portlandia effect, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> what I'd really like to ask that. is um, <clears throat> more about your relationship between the two of you. Um, when, when did you meet and how long have you been friends? I think we met like five or six years ago. Something like that. In the Wyden yeah. and Kennedy, I think, Wyden and Kennedy building. Yeah. Like John Jay's oh, his, dinner. Is dinner, that yeah. the dinner on the roof? Yeah, one of the um, um, executives of, of Wyden and Kennedy, the building that we were talking about, um, was having a dinner party. We met. Yeah, it, it's... I was still thinking about the Portland, New York, or Portland, LA thing. The one thing that happens in small towns is you have you have a, you have communities that form, and it's the same in big cities too. But in Portland, there's this community of people who respect each other and see each other quite a bit, but whose careers expand from there. And I think that it's a sort of unspoken club of of folks that you know, however little we see each other. Or, you know, how, however incidentally we engage, you know, there, there's an intent that we're there, that we're doing this work from there, and that we come back there, and there's, there's some sense of... And we are, but it's two different disciplines, but... Right. Do, do you feel like there's overlaps that you look at each other's work and it inspires ever? Yes, definitely. Um, definitely for me, I'll tell um, you that. Well, it, it, it does, it gets, it gets to that issue for me of he can explore things that, that I, really believe, I really truly believe architecture can't. I mean, you, you try to borrow the power, you know, so, so much of architecture communicates abstractly, and it's, it's not a story, it's, it's, not, it's not based on character. So trying to catch the, capture the spirit of some of that, the sort of soul of some of that work, I mean, that's, that, again, is that issue of looking for the inspiration from other disciplines. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Janice, and um, I just returned from an incredible week in Portland. <laughs> and when I so flew We should have got the Tourism Bureau to back us down here. Well, um, I came in because I, I, I'm a many, many things, but I'm also a professional photographer in love with film, and Gus has been an inspiration for years, and thank you so much to you. <laughs> I. I had an opening at a, a building called, uh, it was the old Crane Building at the Lizard Lounge. But when I flew in, um, I, you were just a part of my thinking, Gus, because I've loved every one of your films. But when I came through the clouds and saw that green space, I thought, I, I just felt that it was paradise. I felt that 
it was it was kind of a combination of every major city I've ever loved, from Paris to San Francisco to New York. Um, and I think my question is, or, or a comment, and then the question is the monumental effect that you really had on, I think, preserving that incredible area in, in the old district, Pearl District. Um, what was your, or how do you see yourself as, as changing and being able to preserve what is so beautiful about the cities? in the architecture that was there. I mean, it was like building after building, and I loved your building because I kept walking around and finding it. But I guess the question is, do you, do you realize how much you really were able to save the magnificent buildings that are there and the thriving energy? Yeah, and then I know that it, it might not have come from that because people kept saying, oh, no, you know, I mean, this was a different space. But you really, I mean, they credit you and your love of Portland with preserving a huge area. Huh. I, I, and I want to know how I you think see I, that. I was, uh, I was recording it. I mean, I was always making sort of films that, that took place either in Old Town or Northwest Portland, uh, maybe a teeny bit downtown. I usually stuck in the Northwest area, um, occasionally on the east side. But, I mean, we were us using... Um, Using the city as a back backdrop to, I think maybe five five different movies that now you can. At the time, we weren't really thinking this way because we were, you know, using we were we were trying to emulate the life of the city through partly its architecture and partly the characters that live there, and the light that's there and um, the stories that come from there that seem to be coming, you know, purely from Portland. But as a strange result, there's this chronicle of the architecture of the city um, that when you look at um, the films, it's, it's, it's recorded things that are no longer there, um, which was not the intention, but um, a byproduct. I have a question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Howard Dratch. I wouldn't have given my name, but they said I had to. Uh, <laughs> my, question, my question has to do with uh, both of you are very successful artists whose art consists of having patrons and large scale art and I'm curious to know how you have handled that situation of having patrons with a lot of money uh, and what challenges you face with a patron and any specific examples of conflicts you've had and as an artist how you have dealt with those and cool projects we've done you know, we just finished a building for Pixar you know you're, you're I'm being asked to manifest a kind of spirit of place and and, and interpret a, a, a character and quality of endeavor and as long as you stay true to those things and and can can uh, interpret what they share or create something that's shared as far as that pursuit, it's usually pretty, you know, it usually works out pretty well. You know, it's hard when there are major donor issues. There were some times in the Columbus Circle, one incidence with a window at the very top where a major donor changed the building under construction while well, really without our okay. So that, 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 I can't even imagine what the parallel, ah, it happens, doesn't it, in your world? Yes. It absolutely does happen, it, it happen all. that way. I mean, but the nice thing about about architecture is is that nobody expects it to make money. I mean, really. I mean, you. You know, I mean, it certainly could increase inspiration and productivity, maybe, perhaps. But I think there's other things that do that a lot better than than buildings. So we I mean, we we have we have at least that. <clears throat> that's the one pressure we don't have to to suffer under. I um, mean, yeah, I think like my version of that might be. Um the donors, or they're not really donors, they're investors. They're looking to make a profit, usually, um, like more directly, like and, uh, more immediately, too, because they're usually thinking the movie will come out um, soon after that, um, maybe within the year. So it can be like a short-term investment. Um, and the movies are so volatile that they usually is like the worst investment ever. <laughs> so the people are, there's a lot of churning and burning in the, in the movie business, except for maybe the big studios, which 
I don't know how they stay afloat, TV, you know, licensing and so forth, but they, um, my style is, you know, there have been probably um, conflicts, you know, at the end of when you, you've made the movie and people aren't happy with it because it's not scoring well, because in, in Hollywood a lot of times they like to score films. If it's scoring well, then they're happy. If it's not scoring well, they're unhappy. But I've also s subverted that by just, um, you know, asking for way less than they would ever expect. And that way, they're not even expecting money back. You know, they're, <laughs> it's filling airtime, like, and with, with some of the smaller movies. And that way, I'm able to just do pretty much whatever I want and escape the expectations, I guess, with a, with a larger budget. I, I like to paraphrase, like, just keep ex expectations really low and then you're fine. Hi, my name is Angel Rayford and uh, this question is for Gus. Um, you mentioned that in the three days before uh, Kurt Cobain's passing, nothing happened. Um, how do you create a complex story with that and uh, how, do you, I, how do you make it interesting for us other than the fact that we want to know and uh, not to disrespect you because I know you're a master at your art but I'm just curious because I'm also a filmmaker and a lot of um, nothing Well happens. I mean there was this big mystery as, as with I guess uh, Jerry and Elephant and Last Days were all uh, tr true events that had kind of a, an unexplainable center uh, like kind of mystery um, and with, in the Kurt Cobain case, it was like, uh, because Kurt was found dead in his house from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, wound but, he, but nobody had apparently seen him during those last three days, that therein lay, lay an answer to what had happened to him. Um, and there was a certain amount, it wasn't like the total focus of like what happened to Kurt, because there were lots of different you know, ex explanations. But there was this like, uh, almost, um, because it was unseen and unknown, it, it gave us uh, an, a, an ability to go in and make it up. There were certain people that say they did see him. There was a detective that like, visited his house. What, I mean, what I meant was not that much, much happened. Stuff happened. And the, that stuff becomes amplified and becomes bigger because like, uh, I think that it, the things that did happen in the last three days of his life were very um, profound, but um, ultimately um, it was maybe day to day. It was it was day to day life, which became profound because it was the end of his life. But it wasn't, um, you know, um, unusual. It was a, a usual day to day sort of thing, which to me was really really interesting, and also not really what people were looking for. People were looking for. Uh, um, answers and action and I thought that there was like non-answer and non-action was really what had happened. I have a question over here. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Kelsey Milano and um, in regards to uh, what inspires each of you, because they're, they're different art forms but they inform each other, architecture and filmmaking, um, but um, uh, you talked about place inspiring you or, or imagining this architecture and then character inspiring you. And I was curious about the film My Own Private Idaho, which isn't actually an observation of any kind of, or, or I mean, because the heart of it is, is Henry IV or that whole um, arc. And, um, and so that's not like an observational character that's present right now. And I was wondering what inspired you to make that film if you saw something in Portland that led you to that character arc or something in that arc that led you to that and how you think those things are connected, if that makes any sense. Is it all for me? I think so. <laughs> um, well, they, I could yeah. Give, I could give it a go. <laughs> I think there were, yeah, there were characters within, um, within our sort of circle of friends that did resemble um, Falstaff and uh, Prince Hal. And when I, you know, when I read those plays and or saw them performed, I was sort of taken with, with how Portland that was. And so I, for the middle part of my own private Idaho, it's sort of made up of three different parts. Um, one was, a, uh, was about two guys on the road. Another one was about two guys on the road that t 
two street hustlers on the road that ended up in Europe, and the other one was uh, uh, Henry the the fourth and Henry the fifth and um, Mary Wives of Win Windsor, sort of like popularized, condensed, um, brutalized, pretty much. Um, and uh, we we sort of like fashioned the characters that we had we had sort of started with and morphed them into these characters, and they came back out at, at the um, in the the European trip. But yeah, I mean, I think there were people that we knew that just resembled Shakespearean characters, and you know, still there are. Um, just come up to Portland. <laughs> I mean, there's some in LA as well, but um, many. Just watch Boss on Friday night. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marlene Creedman, and um, my husband was a big builder, and Forbes magazine had him for the 100 top builders in the country in wow. around 1960. I'm wondering what your opinion is, since you did live downtown on 1 Wilshire. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that building? I, I am not, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't remember. It's been a long time. And there was a lot of uh, well. This was one of the of first high in rises in downtown, and then he has a major. He had a major building in Beverly Hills on Camden and Wilshire, hmm. where the vault was in front of the building. Now it's a restaurant. Huh. And uh, I was just wondering, since this is about forty years ago, thirty years ago, what your opinion would be on the architecture of these buildings. But yeah, I, I, yeah. Sorry, I can't. Okay. Yeah, I have nothing, <laughs> nothing to offer. Sorry. Can we use those slides? <laughs> All right. Well, since you lived on Spring Street in downtown LA, were you familiar with the Alexandria Hotel? It's, again, it's been a long time. Uh, well, that hotel's been there a long time yeah. since 1910. <laughs> anyway, okay. Thanks. Hi, thanks uh, for speaking tonight. I um, appreciated the insight, and I'm really um, finding the correlation between your two respective art forms to be um, uh, kind of uh, telling of the current situation in terms of like what I, I'm trying to envision 3D and if there is an equivalent in architecture, or how you see sequels and franchises and prequels and remakes, and how that's really playing into the film industry, and if, Gus, you have an insight into if you think that's going to go anywhere, or how you uh, view like corporate architecture, if you think that's more of like a sequel, prequel um, area of your world. I'll do the architecture thing because it's faster. I mean, <laughs> I mean, arch architecture has just two, two such. It has two distinct realms. I mean, one of them is architecture as commodity, commercial commodity. Developers. You know, 99.9% .9 of what we see and experience is developed by developers in some way to make money. You know, back to the to the film thing. Um, and and it's yeah, well, it it is what it is. We could talk about that, but so that that realm is all about replication, right? And and commodification and doing whatever it takes to to create interest and they'll hire, you know, fancy architects to sort of dress up the same old buildings to, to try to do that. And that, that gets to this whole branding and branding and collecting of architects now, where if you can sort of put an architect's name on a building, you get, you know, two hundred dollars more a square feet or something. So I mean I I, I think that exists and then there's that one percent who, you know, gets to make films, you know, like, like you know, I get to make buildings like Gus makes films, you know, you, you, you do it for the ideas and it sort of lives on its own, own merits in some way. Um, I mean, the exciting thing about Gus, we were talking about earlier too, is he writes his own film. So you're initiating your own projects from the, from the start and it's just a different, but maybe you want to like have a sequel, you know, Drugstore Cowboy 2. I mean, I've done a remake of Psycho, which was like a, copy, which I think in architecture has probably been done a few times, oh, yeah. like a replication. Um, but I've, ne I've never done a sequel or a, um, you know, a, a real remake. Or, and 3D, I'm not sure. I mean, not positive about that. Great. I think we'll end it here. And we'll see you all at the reception. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks.
Thank you.